it is a great honor for me to, to bring uh, Milan and Adam uh, tonight. Uh, I think that they are uh, some of the most uh, foremost speakers, uh, foremost uh, thinkers and doers in the entire um, neurotech field. Um, my, I, I've gotten to know them over, the, over many years. Uh, I've known Adam for, I think, probably over 10 years now. Uh, Milan, I think I've only gotten to know over the last uh, couple of years. Um, both of them are uh, at the for, for, forefront of the field, uh, and they're pushing the boundaries on several line, several areas of um, neurotech. So they're not just taking on one project, they're trying to create an environment where they can help many different projects at the same time. And they've created a novel structure called a focused research organization, which is a, think of a combination between a, um, the, the intensity of inquiry and the long-term thinking of an academic lab with the um, fast-paced, um, uh, um, super-fast um, approach that startups are known for with the uh, large-scale uh, organized resources of a larger corporation. So think of like the trying to uh, replicate the kind of structure that maybe like the early Apollo program had, or um, say the Manhattan Project, or things like that. Um, but really, uh, kind of tackle some of the most important challenges of our time with this new structure. And I think it's been um, it's fairly new structure, but it's already been tremendously successful. And we'll hear more about it um, um, uh, from them, especially Adam uh, later on. So the setup of the evening tonight will be that Milan will uh, come online and give a. Um, a talk uh, for I think about 40 minutes or so, 45. Um, and then uh, I will ask him some questions and take questions from the audience and from Twitter. Uh, if you're on Twitter, please use the hashtag um, PL Breakthroughs uh, to ask a question for, uh, for Milan. Uh, after that, uh, kind of the hour mark, we will switch over uh, to Adam and we'll uh, do a fireside. So I'll interview Adam and ask a, a whole range of questions. Um, and again, I'll take questions from the audience here and I'll take questions from, uh, from Twitter, so uh, peel breakthroughs there as well. Uh, super excited to, um, to hear from them. This is the, really the, the most, um, this, this is the cutting edge of BCI, and I think if, if humanity has a future um, in, the, in the long term, I think uh, BCI is the, the, the best pathway. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get there. Um, I'll hand it over to Milan, and uh, we'll go from here. Hello. Am I screen sharing in any sort of way? Yeah, you're screen sharing, but we can't see you. I think your video is off. No, that's no good. How's that? There you are. All right. Uh, great. Hey, thanks so much for the introduction. I'll I'll try to give um, some sort of overview of uh, the field of neurotechnology and, and some thoughts about it to uh, lead into Adam and Juan uh, and their fireside chat. Um, one thing I'll, I'll flag at the outset is um, uh, I uh, will use the term uh, probably neurotechnology a little more than I use the term BCI. They nearly mean the same thing. Um, neurotechnology is maybe a slightly more expansive term, but don't don't be freaked out uh, by my use of that term. Um, also, a uh, content warning: um, there is a distressing amount of bad stock imagery that I pulled from the internet for this talk. So just be warned if uh, you're sensitive to. Uh, that kind of uh, bad visuals. Um, so I'd, I'd love to start this talk with some kind of TED Talk level anecdote or cliche or something that drives home why neurotechnology is, in my opinion, tied for the most important thing that civilization needs to be working on right now. Unfortunately, from a PR and field building perspective, neurotechnology doesn't have a single intuitive goal the way that uh, climate technology or longevity research do. Uh, there are so many possibilities and possible use cases that it, it can be hard to make a succinct argument for neurotechnology's importance without being so high level that you're, um, you're uh, risking a nosebleed. Um, I would sort of liken the state of neurotech today to the state of the web in 1990. I think it was self-evident to the true believers who were building the web in 1990 that Increasing communication and connectivity was important for society, but they couldn't point necessarily to a single killer use case that would, that would justify the whole thing. Uh, similarly, it's self-evident to me uh, how much value there is in increasing the precision and effectiveness with which we can interact with the brain and with our own minds. But I think that vision's a little vague for many people, and I think that vagueness is unhelpful. So uh, I won't be able to do it justice here, but I want to start via some sort of brute force examples to enumerate some of the goals of neurotechnology, because I think it's 
not only important to know what the stakes are for success in this field, um, but also I worry people's general conception of neurotechnology is often uh, limited to the idea of controlling our phones with our, our brains or something, as great as that would be. But in fact, that's kind of a, a crushingly narrower vision than I think people like me who work on the field uh, think about it. The first and most obvious thing to mention is the potential for neurotechnology to cure disease and alleviate tremendous amounts of suffering. About 21% uh, of global disease burden is caused by neurological and neuropsychiatric disorders. And if you leave out malnutrition, treatable communicable disease, um, injuries by uh, nature, it's closer to 40% of global disease burden as measured by disability adjusted life years. And that percentage has been steadily increasing. Uh, so concretely, we're talking about uh, neurological disorders like Alzheimer's, ALS, uh, epilepsy, Parkinson's, blindness, uh, and paralysis. And on the neuropsychiatric side, we're talking about things like depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, schizophrenia, the list goes on and on. The point is that even if you're inclined to roll your eyes at the more futuristic stuff that comes later in this talk, the therapeutic potential of neurotechnology alone justifies it being a civilization level priority. Now you might be thinking, well, it already is. We have a whole medical research system. Surely someone's working on this. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that um, society is, is perhaps not maximally adequately deploying its efforts in developing new neurotechnologies. I suspect uh, Adam McQuan will, will touch on that later. I'll also just throw in a note here for the um, longevity fans in the audience. The brain is the ultimately the thing you care about uh, not dying. Uh, and I would contend that it is likely to require special care and attention uh, in as much as uh, it's more sensitive to treatment, at least if you want to be sure that the treatment is preserving whoever uh, you are. Now, at some point it has occurred to most people that what counts as a disease or disability is a little bit relative uh, fatigue, for example. The vast majority of Americans, and I suspect people in the world, use a nanoscale neurotechnology called caffeine every day to regulate their energy levels. It's so ubiquitous that uh, fatigue in the morning is uh, something we excuse as being you know, before we've had our coffee, rather than just the acceptable state of biology. I think you could say similar things about uh, pain before painkillers. So the natural question is, why leave the status quo where it is? Is what we consider a, a good life or even a normal life today going to be considered torture by the standards of a civilization with adequate neurotechnology. Imagine how many people would benefit uh, just from perfect control over their energy level. Imagine a degree you know, far beyond what we can achieve with coffee or other drugs. Improvement in just that one dimension of our conscious experience would unlock massive amounts of well-being. On the other hand, how much well-being would be unlocked uh, by a neurotechnology that generated perfect control over sleep? Imagine perfect quality sleep every time, or just being able to fall asleep whenever you wanted to, uh, or being able to lie down for a nap and setting your brain to wake up in exactly one hour. Um, a, a dream neurotechnology for me personally would be neurotechnological earplugs. Uh, when I get onto an airplane, I wanna be able to turn on perfect reversible deafness until the snap cart uh, comes. Uh, but of course we can imagine much more control over our sensory inputs than that, uh, from enhanced vision, uh, and enhanced hearing all the way to matrix level virtual reality. Things you can also imagine are, you know, flow on demand rather than a website blocker. What if you could just set a timer on your phone to block any distracting thoughts for 30 minutes? Uh, you can imagine enhancing working memory. What would it be like to uh, be introduced to 15 people and effortlessly keep all their names in your head at once? Uh, memory prostheses. What if you could literally commit something to memory in the GitHub sense of commit? Uh, accelerated learning. I'm sure we would all love that. Uh, and of course, the thing that people usually think of when they hear the term uh, brain computer interface, seamless communication with uh, computers, devices, tools, digital content, but also in the future, hopefully seamless communication between people and who knows, maybe even uh, someday with uh, animals. A particular category of neurotechnology that's deeply important to me is giving ourselves the ability to behave like and hopefully become the sorts of people that we already wish we were on reflection. People with better impulse control, people who are more open-minded, people who are more honest and braver with uh, each other and with ourselves. To be clear, this is not some you know feel-good desire on my part. I would contend that a vast proportion of the problems we face individually and as a species 
come down to failures to behave in the way that we already want to behave. A common factor in most, arguably all existential risks to humanity is humans behaving in regretful ways or failing to coordinate or failing to look past their narrow self-interest, even in ways that they agree are bad behavior of themselves. It is somewhat incredible the degree to which uh, our instincts are not suited to the world we live in. Now, of course, our lesser instincts had some sort of evolutionary advantage or at least permissibility, and we should be careful with meddling with them as we should be with any new technology. But all this is to say uh, that, that my vote for the most underrated use cases of neurotechnology are things like control over mood and affect. We all recognize in cases like depression and bipolar that people's moods are not a well-calibrated function of their external circumstances. But outside these pathologized cases, how often are the state of our minds really matched that well with what we are doing in our lives? And what kind of toll does that take? Uh, we don't usually think to tally it up because it's just the way things are. Why is it that when uh, you uh, you go to lunch with your, your boring uncle, you can't just dial up patience and kindness to the level that you're going to wish they were at as soon as you walk out of uh, your boring uncle's house. Uh, I think you know there are absolutely ways to do this badly. We don't want people putting themselves into a stupor or you know running away from their problems. But I think these worries are evidence of an extremely impoverished vision of what we could achieve with adequate neurotechnology. Another underrated use case I think is improving rationality, for example, by the ability to flag or eliminate cognitive biases. Right? Imagine thinking through whether to take a job offer and getting a ping from your phone that says, hey, it looks like uh, your brain activity uh, that you're suffering from status quo bias. Here's a note that you wrote to yourself last time you did this. Uh, being able to install or uninstall uh, motivations, um, habits, predilections, aversions, you can just imagine hypnosis, but a thousand times more effective. Uh, or even being able to generate uh, or, or, or guarantee actual empathy by literally experiencing what someone else has experienced or will experience. There are actually some pretty crazy uh, proofs of concept of this that have been done with VR, but they could go so much farther because um, it's a crypto audience, I guess. Uh, imagine if um, if I feel your pain was a literally enforceable promise that you could make in a smart contract uh, and not just something that uh, people say. And lastly, and probably most importantly, uh, let's talk about AI. Uh, I don't have to convince this audience. I don't think that artificial intelligence seems extremely likely to play a transformative role in society in the near future. And I don't have to convince you, I don't think that this uh, transformation is not guaranteed to go uh, well. Um, but I would like to suggest something that I, I don't hear much in the AI discourse, which is that uh, neurotechnology, while not a silver bullet by any means, is an important part of a broader portfolio of AI safety and alignment efforts. The high level intuition for this is simply that human values come from uh, here. No matter your thoughts on uh, on moral realism or metaethics in general, this one and a half kilogram cluster of cells in our skulls is empirically the ultimate arbiter of morality. And if you think that that's wrong, uh, consider where whether that one and a half kilogram cluster of cells in your skull is playing a role in you forming that uh, opinion. Now, we have introspection and language to get access to some of what's going on in here, and those are very useful. But a few thousand years worth of attempts of using introspection and language to operationalize the moral judgments of this one and a half kilogram cluster of cells hasn't yet produced anything that seems particularly suitable for aligning AI. So considering other approaches seems prudent. One potentially pivotal use case of neurotechnology uh, regarding AI is obtaining greater quantity and quality of data on human values than we can get from language or other conscious expressions of morality like voting. Uh, AI progress in the recent past has tended to be driven by large data sets. The progress, broadly speaking, is where the data are. If human values are the things we want an AI to learn, providing it with more higher quality data on human values might be wise. What are these better data? One could imagine a neuroimaging implant that passively observes the brain producing moral intuitions or making moral judgments, especially if that was combined with real world contextual data. It's one thing to verbally express a moral judgment about a situation, especially a hypothetical situation. It's another to watch it happen in real time in context. And of course, observing the brain's um, computations during these complex conscious moral deliberations gives more resolution on that process than can be expressed even if someone's just thinking aloud. Uh, 
Another interesting use case might be direct measurements of subjective well-being in the brain, although first we'd have to disentangle what subjective well-being is at the neurological level uh, in order to measure it. Now, of course, you have to avoid wireheading in, in such a case, and that becomes extremely important, but potentially possible. Another potentially valuable use case for neurotechnology related to AI is for figuring out which aspects, if any, of the brain we would like an AI to emulate. Uh, the human brain may be the closest thing we have to an optimizer that is aligned with human values. And so emulating aspects of its operation might be very useful for designing safe AI. Um, I'll give a shout out to, to Steve Burns here, whose work on this I think is really great. Uh, in the limit of understanding everything about the brain and being able to simulate it, of course, you'd have whole brain emulation, which um, uh, would be aligned with, I guess, at least one uh, human's values by definition, uh, whoever's getting uploaded. But less than perfect mimicry, uh, more tractable kinds of mimicry might still yield more aligned systems on shorter time scales. Uh, or potentially AIs built to emulate the operation of the brain might be easier to test for alignment, especially if you have a functioning human brain to compare them to. This would be kind of a partial emulation uh, approach. This is obviously a big unknown and carries some risks of good ideas from neural computation accelerating AI progress, but I think it's well worth exploring. Uh, I, should, uh, I should make explicit the connection to neurotechnology here rather than just neuroscience is that neurotechnology uh, is, or neuroscience is bottlenecked mainly by, by tools, I would argue. So better neuroscience to learn these things would require better neurotechnology. And then finally, there's this notion of, of merging humans with AI, which for example, Neuralink has cited as, as one of their long-term goals. It's not, it's not entirely clear how an AI human hybrid would be structured. Uh, and it's generally thought that such hybrids would not be competitive with pure AI systems in the long run, but they may be useful during early stages of AI development, especially in takeoff scenarios that are sensitive to uh, initial conditions that um, a lot to think about there. Again, none of the proceeding uh, is guaranteed to make transformative AI go well. And uh, none of these things are likely to be relevant on a sub five year time scale. Uh, I do not think that we should be you know, diminishing our efforts on, on large language model safety or interpretability or governance right now. However, now also does not seem like a great time for civilization to be uh, prematurely limiting approaches toward AI safety that it's exploring. And as I've hopefully made some kind of case for here, neurotechnological approaches seem like a very worthwhile addition to civilization's portfolio um, of uh, alignment approaches. Lastly, on just this sort of goal section, I, like any new technology, there are absolutely uses uh, that I don't personally advocate for. I think you know, perfect lie detectors in the hands of authoritarian governments uh, would be one. Addictive technologies that don't come bundled with de-addiction tools, uh, accidental corruption uh, or, or reinforcement of bad values or, or giving AI um, systems additional uh, attack surface on human minds. These are all outcomes I would not like to see. Uh, and I'll just say that I think Good governance of potent future neurotechnologies is an important part of avoiding these outcomes and is something that I hope uh, the, the brilliant minds at places like Protocol Labs and those of you in the audience can help find uh, solutions for in addition to, to society at large working on these problems. Okay, um, let's uh, come down from the razzle dazzle a little bit. Uh, now that I've hopefully painted something of a picture of the value of neurotechnology, uh, let's look at the state of the field today. And I'll just start by recapping some neurotechnologies that are widely used either in medicine or in society in general. First, uh, it's only fair to start by mentioning the uh, OG and still most widely used type of neurotechnology, which is small molecule drugs. We're all familiar with drugs. Uh, you probably take them every day in some form. Uh, drugs have a pretty good UX for neurotechnology. Once they're in you, they last all day. Usually you don't have to uh, you know, wear or charge anything, but they're hard to turn off uh, once you've taken them. And despite their profound and diverse effects, they aren't particularly flexible or programmable. So while their historical importance should not be understated and they're very useful as demonstrations of the manipulability of consciousness, drugs aren't uh, going to get us to uh, BCI on their own. Also just a shout out to cognitive techniques like meditation, hypnosis, brain training software. I don't count these as neurotechnologies per se, but like drugs, they're used by millions, if not billions of people every day. And the effects they have are, are instructive, I think, for neurotechnology development. The category of neurotechnologies that uh, people probably most associate with BCI are methods that interact with the nervous system via electrical signals. Um, EEG or electroencephalography is one of the most common methods you might've heard of. It's nearly a hundred years old. It's uh, probably what's in most consumer products out there that brand themselves as neurotechnologies. There are different flavors of, uh, of EEG, the 
left is showing this non-invasive EEG, like what you might buy in a, a consumer headset. Um, the right showing invasive electrocorticography on the surface of the brain that's used for uh, in, in um, epilepsy treatment, for example, to localize seizures. Uh, all of them work by measuring voltage changes produced by the activity of large groups of neurons near the electrodes. And of course, electricity can be used to stimulate neurons as well as to record. Um, and electrodes can be made small enough to record from and stimulate individual neurons or small groups of neurons. This has been used uh, for cochlear implants shown on the left here since the 1970s. Tens of thousands of these cochlear implants are implanted every year. A uh, similar idea is used in, in retinal implants, although they've had slower adoption. Um, but the idea is that you, know, you have some kind of external camera or receiver microphone and that uh, transmits signals to a, an array of different electrodes in the case of a retinal implant that inter interface with the, the retina. On the right here, uh, most people haven't heard of um, deep brain stimulation, uh, but it's the most commonly performed surgical procedure for Parkinson's and a number of other um, treatments. Uh, it's used if drugs don't work or stop working, uh, and it's around 150,000 uh, deep brain stimulation uh, implants are, are uh, inserted or implanted every year. Um, so it's, a, it's also a very useful uh, case study uh, for uh, bridging neurotechnologies. Another widely used technology I'm kind of surprised people don't know more about is transcranial magnetic stimulation or TMS. Uh, it's a non-invasive method. It works by electromagnetic induction. It's FDA approved for uh, depression, anxiety, OCD, and smoking cessation. Usage statistics are a little tricky, but it seems like 50,000 plus people a year use it. It's not super precise in terms of where it targets, but lots of improvements are being made. Uh, recently, a new protocol called the SAINT protocol, S-A-I-N-T, was developed uh, that in its first trial had very high uh, remission rates uh, for depression and a startup is now uh, commercializing that. Another technology to mention is, is MEG or magnetoencephalography that measures magnetic fields produced by the currents in the brain. As you can see from this picture, uh, it's not super widely used today because the hardware and shielding uh, required is pretty hefty, but the underlying physics uh, are advantageous compared to EEG because magnetic fields are less distorted, distorted by the skull and the scalp. Uh, so in principle, you could read a lot of information from the brain from an advanced MEG system. And then we have a MRI, which most people are familiar with, um, or functional MRI when you use it to detect uh, neural activity. The changes in blood oxygen that fMRI picks up are slower than the electrical signals uh, that move around the brain. They tend to be on the order of half a second to a second. So you're not going to want to control your phone using uh, an fMRI anytime soon. But uh, fMRI is non-invasive, and it can image the whole brain, which are great features. Uh, as you can see on the left, it's not particularly portable yet. Um, but even with the slow time scales, uh, you might be surprised what you can accomplish with these signals. Here is an example where researchers trained a deep generative model on fMRI activity. And using that model, they were able to show a person an image of a face like the ones on the left, uh, watch their brain activity with fMRI, and then reconstruct the image with that model uh, from only the fMRI data. Uh, okay, so this is all stuff you've probably heard of. What does the frontier look like now? Uh, where by frontier, I'm, I'm defining that by being used in humans, which is a critical milestone in any neurotechnology's uh, life. The next generation technology most people are familiar with are electrode-based motor brain-computer interfaces. Uh, the basic idea here is to put a lot of small electrodes very near the neurons responsible for motor function in the cortex in the outer part of the brain and determine a user's movement intentions straight from those uh, neurons, from the activity of those neurons. There are a variety of different form factors that this can take. Um, ECOG is electrocorticography. That's what we saw on the, on the slide before. The most widely, stuttered, uh, most, uh, widely studied uh, uh, systems for motor BCIs are these microelectrode arrays, which in the picture on the bottom here is what the patient has implanted. You can see the cable uh, coming out from her head. Uh, to date, there have been over 30,000 patient days of inpatient research with these microelectrode arrays. So there's really no question at this point that the principle works. It's a matter of improving the devices themselves in a variety of ways, making them smaller, having fewer adverse effects when implanted, and then, of course, getting them approved uh, by regulators. Another approach you can take uh, that's being explored is to place electrodes in the blood vessels near the neurons of interest and not directly in the brain, um, which you can see in the middle here. That's the endovascular approach. Uh, the advantages of approaches like this are that you don't have to drill holes in the skull. You can just go in through a vein somewhere in your extremities and uh, drop these electrodes off near where the near the neurons they need to listen to. Um, Synchron is a company that's pushed this method uh, the farthest at the moment. They have implanted, I think, five patients so far, all severely paralyzed, and four of them have had the implant for a little over a year, 
and uh, supposedly have used them to send text messages and, and manage their finances and things like that. Um, all four of the, those long-term patients are in Australia, where it's a little easier to do human research uh, of this kind. Um, it's also worth mentioning you can make a motor BCI that doesn't involve the brain. So on the left is a prosthetic arm that reads signals from uh, the nerves in the upper arm. On the right is a system from uh, Meta, um, that is uh, formerly Facebook, Meta. They uh, acquired a company called Control Labs uh, that makes this uh, hands-free gesture detector for use with VR systems. So you don't have to hold anything uh, while you're using VR. It's uh, based off electrical signals from the muscles in the forearm, so it's not exactly a BCI, but it's pretty close. Another emerging uh, neurotechnology is ultrasound-based methods. Uh, one type of ultrasound neurotechnology is already FDA approved. I just didn't mention it in the previous section because um, it's more of a surgical technique. Uh, this technique is called high intensity focused ultrasound or HIFU. In HIFU, uh, waves uh, sort of depicted on the, on the right here um, can be focused on a target in the brain and then used to destroy uh, tissue, to ablate tissue like tumors or uh, neurons that are damaged by Parkinson's disease. Um, this is a non-invasive procedure uh, in the sense that no, no physical matter is entering the body. Um, the ultrasound waves are entering the body. And it's used by at least hundreds of patients uh, every year and maybe more so that you would lie uh, on this one on the left here you basically lie with your head in this dome in an mri scanner and then um, the ultrasound is uh targeted to the area of interest but ultrasound uh, is just a generally very useful physical phenomenon uh beyond ablating tissue because it propagates readily uh, through soft tissue and it has a very long safety record you know we're comfortable with imaging fetuses with it among other nice properties. Um, and it's currently in clinical trials for a lot of other things besides this surgical use case. For one, um, if you take these hypo systems and turn their power way, 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 way down to the point where uh, it's not damaging the tissue, it turns out that even when you do that, ultrasound has some kind of local effect on neural activity where that beam is focused. Uh, this goes by a few different names, but you can look up uh, transcranial ultrasound stimulation or TUS to find it. How this works isn't well understood yet, uh, if you talk to people who have had it done, there are certainly some some undeniable short-term effects, it seems, uh, though, of course, it's not clear what those are indicative of or what, uh, you know, they'll be useful for. But transcranial ultrasound uh, is currently in trials for a number of things in humans. Uh, there's a trial going on for epilepsy, uh, for depression, PTSD, a few other things. Ultrasound can also be used for imaging, um, similar to fMRI. Shown on the right here, um, this is a mouse brain, not a human brain, but the, the spinny GIF was prettier. Um, but it's being trialed in humans uh, as well as in mice. Uh, unlike an fMRI though, uh, it, there's potential for people to actually be able to you know, wear uh, an ultrasound imaging system like this or have one implanted, um, which opens up a lot of exciting possibilities for the future. Uh, near infrared spectroscopy or functional near infrared spectroscopy, FNIRS is another family of methods. Kind of like fMRI, they look at changes in blood oxygenation, um, although they can look at other things, but uh, like ultrasound, uh, it seems much more tractable to make uh, into a wearable form factor than an fMRI machine. And uh, I know that because people have done it. So on the right side here is a device made by Kernel. It's called the Kernel Flow. Um, I, they were at some point doing a clinical trial. You might actually be able to go use one of these if you're in the Los Angeles area. Uh, I went and tried one at one point. This uses a particular type of, of FNIRS called TD FNIRS. Um, current NIRS techniques don't allow imaging the entire brain. Like fMRI does, they're uh, limited to like, I think about a centimeter of depth but uh, it's in clinical trials for a variety of applications, all as an imaging tool. And then lastly, um, gene therapy is a very hot area for uh, biotech and therapeutic development in general, uh, and is, is also being applied to the brain. A gene therapy, if you haven't heard of it, is a technique that introduces genetic material into a cell. Um, there have been thousands of clinical trials for gene therapies for disease treatments at this point. Um, most of those are not targeted at the brain, but some are. The main challenge uh, when you're making a gene therapy tends to be delivery. Uh, how do you get the genetic material into the cells that you want? One way to do that is to package the, the DNA or RNA into some kind of uh, lipid or polymer. If you have received an mRNA vaccine for COVID, then congratulations, you've had this type of gene therapy. Um, but another uh, uh, kind of um, uh, way of building these um, uh, vectors is to, I think this is fair to say has, has more research on it at the moment, is to use viruses to deliver the genes. Uh, these uh, delivery vehicles are called viral vectors, shown here in this image on the top left. Viruses are, are nature's experts at sneaking around your body and inserting genetic material into cells. And so they can be engineered, hopefully, to do so with specific 
useful properties like um, selectively targeting certain types of cells or tissues. As I said, most of the gene therapies that are in clinical trials now are related to diseases like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Uh, we're talking about neurogene therapy. But because you can fairly arbitrarily swap out the genetic information in a viral vector to whatever you want to encode different proteins, once some of these gene therapies are developed for neurological diseases, they're uh, likely to be a massive enabler for neurotechnology in general. It's kind of like um, having a general deployment platform like AWS, and you can just swap out the code uh, that, that's running on it. I guess in that metaphor, the, the, the VM is, is the, the viral vector, uh, and then the, the functional gene is the code. OK, uh, I wanted to pause here briefly and just uh, empathize with uh, possibly some members of the audience. If you're anything like me when I was when I started Neurotech, you might be thinking that this all just seems like a massively scattershot set of tools and techniques uh, and might be wondering if there's a neat ontology that these all uh, fall into. Um, if there is, I, I don't I don't know of it. A uh, neurotechnology isn't quite as simple as just fabricate more and more smaller electrodes and stick them more places, although it's not a bad approach necessarily. Um, but brains are, are complicated biological systems, and there are so many ways to interact with them, different physical forces, different biological substrates to, to interact with, different routes into the brain itself, you know, the vascular, drill a hole, that kind of thing. Uh, so it's not clear which neurotechnological approach is going to ultimately lead to which degrees of tro control uh, over the nervous system and what effects each one will have. So I just wanted to acknowledge that feeling, uh, if you're feeling it. Um, and also, I wanted to suggest, though, that this, this huge frontier is one of the things that makes neurotechnology so exciting. There are so many paths toward progress and good ideas to be tried. Uh, and with that framing, I, I can't predict the future, but I want to go over some, some general themes for the future of, of neurotechnology. One big theme is basically a ride on the coattails of the digital hardware revolution. Uh, on the right side here is a picture of a, a Neuralink prototype, which it is safe to say you know, would not exist without technologies taken from the smartphone, chip, automotive, and, and other related industries that have created engineering marvels that are ripe for porting over into the domain of neurotechnology. Uh, this includes making devices wireless that would have once been wired, thanks to things like Bluetooth or wireless charging or powering, miniaturizing everything, lowering the power requirements of integrated circuits in devices, and um, using microelectromechanical systems, or MEMS, uh, to enable ultrasound and other kinds of physical perturbations at a small scale. Another big theme uh, is uh, get biology to do your work for you. Uh, so why distribute metal electrodes throughout the brain when you can just tell neurons to make something that's basically as good? Uh, it's a little oversimplified, but a, a prototypical example of this is called optogenetics. It's, this graphic is, is showing. The idea here is to use uh, gene therapy, uh, like I mentioned before, to make neurons express proteins that are sensitive to light. Now, neurons normally aren't especially sensitive to light or not specific wavelengths of light. But you can use gene therapy to instruct a neuron to express a particular light-sensitive protein that isn't normally found in the human body at all. And then you can use light to make them fire. Optogenetics is uh, one of the most commonly used techniques in neuroscience research. I'm not aware of it making its way into humans yet, uh, but that is absolutely a hotly pursued goal. And there's lots of animal work uh, pursuant to it. Uh, if you've heard of a company called a Science Corp or science.xyz, I, I believe they're using an optogenetic approach, although I don't have any insider information on that. Uh, optogenetics is just one clever bioengineering approach. There are many more that are being developed and will be discovered in the future. So kind of the general theme here is that, uh, that like with um, microfabrication, there's, there's a useful tailwind where developments in bioengineering in general can be usefully ported over to use in neurotechnology. A third big theme is combining modalities in clever ways. So for example, optogenetics actually, which I just talked about is an example of this. Uh, it combines optical methods um, and bioengineering. Another example is using ultrasound to open the blood brain barrier. Uh, if you haven't heard of the blood brain barrier, uh, you've obviously never watched the TV show house. That's fine. Um, basically uh, nearly every blood vessel in your brain is uh, shrink wrapped in an extra protective layer of cells that keeps uh, most of the stuff in your blood from diffusing into your brain. Sometimes people hear blood brain barrier and they think that it's like a sac that your brain is in, but it's actually, it's every blood vessel is just is, uh, uh, surrounded by this blood brain barrier. 
Um, this can be, oh, it's great for your immune system and, and probably other things, but it's, it can be annoying for drug delivery because a lot of drugs don't go through the blood brain barrier. They go everywhere else in your body, but not there. Uh, so one clever thing you can do is inject little micro bubbles into your bloodstream and those circulate all over your body, including your brain. And then you can use ultrasound to vibrate those little micro bubbles in a specific area of the brain it's shown on the left of this big, big picture. Uh, and that little vibration gently pushes the cells of the blood brain barrier apart and lets drug molecules sneak through into the brain. So this is a, a cool combination because it lets you combine the uh, precise biological effects of drugs with the spatial precision of a focused ultrasound beam. Uh, and I should mention, this is also in clinical trials in humans right now. Uh, there's some uh, very promising uh, looking uh, trial results for treating brain tumors, uh, for example. Um, I tried to avoid text slides, but I, I couldn't get away with it here. Uh, I talked at the beginning about how there isn't a single unifying goal of, of neurotechnology. Uh, and that's, that's true for the effects that we want, but also to some degree on the technical side. So I guess, you know, one trivially could say that the technical objective of neurotechnology is to have constant control over every aspect of the state of every neuron all the time. That's maybe true, uh, but frankly, a civilization that could do that probably doesn't have much need for biological brains uh, anyway, that's pretty advanced. So practically speaking, as a general theme for the future, there are many performance characteristics of neurotechnologies that will have to be traded off with each other in different ways for different neurotechnologies. And the trade-offs that you wanna make depend on what goal you're trying to, uh, to achieve. So some of the big factors to think about with any neurotechnology, I'm not gonna just read these off, but things like spatial resolution, right? how finely in space can the uh, neurotechnology sense or manipulate tissue? Um, spatial extent, so how much of the brain or the nervous system can the method access? So the Neuralink probe is useful to kind of compare to something like fMRI here. So the Neuralink probe has extremely high uh, spatial resolution, but a very limited spatial extent. It only goes into one small part of the cortex, whereas an fMRI has lower spatial resolution by quite a bit, but it can image the entire brain. So uh, the general theme here is not that these trade-offs uh, exist, I, that's true, but it's in, in general, we don't know in many cases what degree of performance on which of these dimensions will let us achieve what effects. Now that's a challenge to some extent, but it's also part of what makes uh, neurotechnology so exciting. We don't know what effects each new generation of neurotechnologies will unlock, but every new generation of neurotechnologies uh, that pushes the Pareto, pushes for some you know Pareto improvement along these, these various dimensions uh, has revealed things that are, are completely unexpected and uh, exciting. This is more of a macro point, but, but kind of a last theme I think is important. Neurotechnology, in my opinion, is not primarily bottlenecked by ideas. It's primarily bottlenecked by the pace of experimentation. There is no single point of blame here. I think people will often think to point their fingers at investors, you know, regulators, institutional review boards, scientific and entrepreneurial conservatism. All these things probably play some contributing role. But the things that get me most excited in neurotechnology are ways of breaking this chicken and egg problem, which is that in order to build new tools and or new, new neurotechnologies and run new experiments, uh, you need to have uh, uh, data to guide that. But the data you know, can't be obtained without these new tools or experiments being run. Um, so yeah, as I said, I, I think uh, anything that kind of breaks this chicken and egg problem, even just a little bit, uh, is, is hugely important for neurotechnology. Now, I have not done a thorough forecasting or timelines or anything for um, for transformative uh, neurotechnology, partly because, as we've seen in this talk, neurotech is a very diverse area. But I do think that on the default current path, neurotechnologies that are currently in clinical trials, like some of the ones I described earlier, could have large-scale impacts in you know one to five decades with a, a mean estimate of I don't know, 30 years. Uh, that's based on the translation and dissemination paths of previous neurotechnologies that have, have been developed. However, with concerted effort and entrepreneurial non-standard thinking focused on speeding up the cycle, I think that neurotechnologies currently in clinical and preclinical development could be advanced in five to 10 years to the point where there is some non-medical, non-drug neurotechnology with thousands of daily users. And I think neurotechnology in, uh, in 10 to 20 years could be advanced to the point where uh, these technologies might meaningfully benefit uh, AI safety and other uh, valuable goals that I mentioned uh, at the top. Okay, so we come to the most important slide, uh, maybe also the ugliest slide, uh, which is getting involved. Uh, 
this exclamation uh, is directed genuinely at everyone who is listening to this. The blessing of the high dimensional frontier and the messy toolbox that I mentioned earlier is that there is useful work for nearly every skill set I can think of in neurotechnology. On the technical side, uh, you know, software engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, mathematicians, chemists, chem engineers, biologists, bioengineers, physicists, surgeons, doctors, of course, uh, neuroscientists. All of these things are uh, extremely important skill sets that are needed to push neurotechnology forward. Uh, and if you're thinking, ha, he didn't mention geologists. Actually, no. Some of the most exciting ideas around non-invasive ultrasound imaging are coming from geophysics. So you might be surprised uh, that whether or not you can uh, be useful uh, in this field if you if you take a crack at it. Um, entrepreneurs and operators are just as critical. Like bringing together and managing all the the technical skill sets required to build neurotechnologies, you know, building real products in the real world, running clinical trials. This requires entrepreneurship and operational expertise just as much as the technical stuff. Uh, lastly, uh, uh, content creators, um, as this talk has irrefutably demonstrated, neurotechnology needs better evangelists or even uh, remotely competent evangelists, uh, writers, designers, podcasters, uh, what have you, all useful. You can save neurotechnology from my uh, slide design. And so much needs to be done, a non-exclusive list of things that you can do, right? Uh, start up a company, start a non-company, for example, a focused research organization. You can contribute to research that's going on right now. I cannot tell you how many neurotechnologists would kill uh, for a volunteer web developer or dozens of other skill sets. Uh, you can study up on the field and help others learn by you know, creating uh, good content. There is, is much less useful uh, content to learn from on neurotechnology as there is for something like AI or crypto. Um, and of course, you can invest in neurotechnology projects. You can fund neurotechnology projects that, that aren't uh, for profit ventures, and you can incubate projects, right? You can lend your expertise to the people doing technical work uh, in this space. Uh, if this sounds abstract, the best way I know of to make it concrete is honestly to email me. Um, I can help route you to projects that might be of interest to you. And uh, there is an extreme uh, dearth of, of writing uh, that I would like to have done, but there is at least some more information on, on my website uh, that you can find that goes into more detail on, I think, pretty much all the stuff I talked about today. Uh, and with that, uh, I think it's uh, question time. Can I get a, just a round of applause? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is an extremely useful overview. Um, I have been thinking about BCI and learning about it for uh, many years now, and I learned a, a bunch of new things here. So thank you. This is extremely useful um, and helped us all update. Um, so I have a couple of questions, but I want to kind of really enable um, a lot of the audience to to ask their questions here. So um, I'll ask for questions from the audience, but also uh, Twitter. So if you're in the live stream and so on, just um, send out a tweet with the hashtag PL breakthroughs, and I'll see it and be able to um, ask your question. So um, and there will be a mic uh, going around here in the space. Uh, if you just raise your hands, and um, Mike will come to you. Uh, so I'll start with a couple of questions. So um, how do you think, so it's extremely useful to see where the field is now and kind of where it's headed. Um, how do you, how far do you think we are from starting to couple some of these systems to the more advanced computing um, systems that we have, like some of the more advanced uh, neural net architectures and so on to start and um, figure out how to enhance some of the, um, some of these applications, right? So a lot of the applications so far have been about like very basic, um, Kind of motor control and very basic uh, use use of existing uh, personal computers and so on, like uh, you know moving a cursor, typing and so on. So you were trying to like map the brain signals into moving a mouse, mapping the brain signals into typing, and then from there try to like operate through um, you know the, the existing interfaces, which were designed for our eyes, not for our brains. Uh, and so like how far away do you think like um, actually starting to use uh, computing systems that are that are more blended with um, how our brain thinks, or can maybe we can maybe leverage neural nets to start learning um, how to communicate and so on, but can start doing something much more meaningful. Where either um, you know, I suspect it's going to be dramatically easier to extract signals from the brain and then actuate something than maybe go the other way. But um, you know, how, if you were to sort of like guess, what were some of the what would be some of the promising ways to kind of um, enhance the brain in the way that maybe like 
the neocortex enhances the limbic and, and, um, and reptilian brains, uh, how would you go about doing it? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I can make two specific predictions, but maybe some, some relevant thoughts here are, um, I do think that the, um, there's nothing really stopping um, the application of you know, more advanced computing techniques to the data um, that are coming out of the brain at the moment. I, people are you know, applying um, machine learning to all the modalities that I went over at the beginning that, like, that we know uh, work and that are easy to access. So I do think it's it's much more of a, a question of just getting the information out, and then the um, you know, like deep nets or whatever are kind of just ripe to to push uh, the technology forward on that front. Um, and again, it just sort of I guess I'm just reiterating what I, I said in the talk, but I, I do think a lot of this comes down to where can people flexibly experiment. So you know we we know right the hippocampus is involved in memory just somehow. I mean as people who are experts in this know way more than that. I'm not saying that's the state of the field, but, um, you know, there are certain areas of the brain that we know are implicated in certain, um, aspects of thought. Um, but what you can't do really straightforwardly right now is just go drop a bunch of electrodes in there and see what happens, at least in, in a human, I should say. And I guess maybe I, it's worth mentioning implicitly here. Um, of course, animal research is extremely valuable, um, for learning about, um, nervous systems and, and for developing things. But, uh, as people have probably realized, you know, it's, there's a big jump from even from monkeys into humans in terms of creating use cases that people care about. Um, and there's, you know, some question of, you know, is it even possible for non-humans to, to have, uh, for example, diseases like depression in the same way that humans? Like, is there a linguistic component? Um, open question. Uh, so again, this like flexibility of experimentation. You know, it, it's obviously it'd be a fishing expedition, but I wouldn't be surprised if you put, you know, some. Uh, managed to get some electrode array into the hippocampus and could just play around, you would find some pretty interesting things. The question, of course, is can you tie that to something that will like generate revenue? Um, can you invest the upfront capital to go do that experiment? Uh, not not easy. But I mean, I only went through that one fMRI example, but there are a lot of pretty crazy uh, examples of what people will do during you know uh, experiments in the middle of brain surgery where they have access to the cortex and things. So I guess I would say I don't know what the specific use cases are. But I wouldn't be surprised if sometimes it feels like these really profound uses are just like one little tissue curtain away and we just haven't bothered to go in that direction. Um, I'd almost, I mean, I think not to get too abstract, but I think psychedelics are kind of an example of this in a way where it's like, it's just a little molecule and just gets into your brain and completely like puts you on a rocket ship to outer space. Like nothing, you know, it's not like we're like ripping your head off to do this. It's just like we're tickling your serotonin receptors in a little bit of a different way. And we happen to have access to that one thanks to plants trying to mess us up. Um, but uh, it's probably true of all these electrode based methods and things too. So that experimentation pace, I think, is really the key driver of discovering these things. But I think there are discoveries to be made for sure that are really close to hand, frankly, with existing tech. Um, if you were to sort of um, guess at some of the ways in which we can accelerate um, the experimentation and so on, uh, in do you think that there's, my guess is one part is, um, helping experimentation in, in, especially in the US where a lot of the, the neurotech experimentation is happening. But do you see any other countries that might have a much better regulatory structure um, where um, regulators may be dramatically more aware of like the, the massive human costs of not doing this R&D? Meaning um, you know, the, the US um, just historically um, has been uh, extremely focused on not, um, on kind of like harm to existing humans but not at all really prioritizing that much future humans. And so this is, you know, and this is very common in most um, uh, governments set up in the, in the 1700s and so on, because this was before we had a, a morality of, of like future hum humans and so on. Um, but now when you start accounting for all of the potential people that don't exist yet, and, and you think about like the weighing their preferences and so on, you end up in a very different calculus, um, let alone kind of, um, the, the classic example of like doing R and D now for for the greatest benefit of of all and so on. Um, do you see any other any kind of other governments that might be um, thinking ahead to this or, or or much more kind of acutely aware of the importance of this? Well, yeah, I guess I would. I'm certainly, I'm not as much of an expert on this as I uh, would like to be, and I'm trying to educate myself more on this. It's it's the kind of thing that's not usually written down on the internet, so it takes a while of talking to people <laughs> to figure this out. Um, but uh, I mean, like some stylized facts I can give. Well, one, one thing I'll say is, I don't know if I would put it all on, I, I guess it depends what you count as regulatory. There are a lot of factors that go into it. I mean, certainly regulatory rules are, are a very uh, uh, important factor. 
um, but also the culture of things like like institutional review boards and, and you know, surgeons. There's um, things that are not you know legal on the book that are really just uh, norms based. So I guess maybe one one kind of stylized fact here. You know I don't know if this is usefully answer your question, but just like an interesting fact is that while in the U.S. Um, uh, drugs and biological therapeutics and medical devices are regulated by the FDA. Um, surgeries are not are not regulated. There's no one ever got approved to like remove someone's wisdom teeth. Well, I, guess I don't know about dentistry, but I assume it's the same as <laughs> other surgeries. Um, instead, surgery is regulated by uh, surgical boards. So basically, you can just lose your license if the surgery board thinks that you're uh, operating outside what's best for patients. But there's no rule on the books anywhere that says a plastic surgeon can't go do brain surgery. Uh, they can sort of legally do that. Uh, they just will be will be um, you know reprimanded in other ways. So. All this is just a, that's just one example of sort of how complicated these things are, like combination of regulatory factors, norms, things like that. Uh, in terms of jurisdictions, again, I also I don't really know. I mean, the European uh, medical device regulation was sort of famously um, more focused on safety rather than safety and efficacy, which is what the U.S.'s standard tends to be. Um, but even in the U.S., medical device regulation is quite different from drug regulation. Uh, and actually, I'm not sure that the European um, medical agency, I think, has maybe changed some rules, so I'm not sure that still holds up. Australia, I think I mentioned earlier in the talk, is, is also an interesting example, and I don't think it's unique. I think this may be true of like New Zealand and stuff too, but um, Australia is where the uh, the first work on the stentrode was done, that like in blood vessel um, B BCI I talked about. Uh, and yeah, certainly if you listen to interviews with um, with the CEO of Synchron, they, they mentioned how important it was to do that work in Australia. They never would have been able to do it in the US. So, all this is that is not like I'm saying Australia is the best place to do anything. I guess I'm just saying that I think there are actually there's like a lot of variants here that would be really usefully explored. And again, to shill for people to work on neurotech, if someone you know wanted to devote a month to um, studying this stuff and writing a blog, I mean, I would be massively uh, appreciative of that. So there's definitely it's not just that everything is totally locked down and we're never going to get out of this. I think I think there really are opportunities to um, be clever about how to accelerate this research. Yeah. Uh, all right, any questions from the audience or Twitter? Raise your hands back there. Hi, um, I have a really weird ethics question, and it's kind of the same one I asked Juan the first time I met him, actually. Um, so when you see food manufacturing uh, get a lot easier and all of a sudden agriculture gets a lot better, we're able to produce all this corn and soy, we're able to produce crazy amounts of chicken, um, you see the nutrition content and the quality of the food go down. So you see places like, you know, food deserts where all the kids are obese and they're also all mal like malnourished um, and like suffering from all these diseases and decreased lifespan. Um, and that's something that came out of we're able to really accelerate the growth in one dimension. We're able to make a lot of crap. And then that kind of has all these ramifications we weren't expecting. Do you know if anyone is thinking about the ramifications of, you know, what I'm really concerned about is speeding up education, having fast food education where it just gets downloaded into the brain, you know, maybe things get lost, maybe, you know, all the socialization that happens in 18 years of school gets, you know, totally canned and you have these like clone human beings who just haven't been shaped by social forces in the same way. Do you know if anyone's thinking about it? Um, do you have any thoughts about it? Um, yeah, I would just love to hear you talk about it because that's my big um, worry. No, that's. I think those are really good points to bring up, and I didn't spend enough time on the on the sort of risks side. I was going to be a bit of a booster in this talk, but I do think there are lots of ways that all of these technologies can go can go wrong, which is I think true of any any technology. Um, in terms of who is thinking about it, I mean, there is a field of neuroethics. Um, it's not uh, so overwhelmingly full of of people that all these ideas have been explored in in detail. Um, and I mean, I, I'm not a deep reader in that literature. I've obviously read, you know, skimmed a lot of things from that field. And, and my sense is that it tends to, I haven't seen that much, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like people haven't looked at these frontier technologies as closely. Like, I don't know, maybe these exist and I haven't seen them, but I haven't seen people who do like deep sort of neuroethics analyses of, of like just ultrasound or something like that, or just, just focused ultrasound. So I think that, you know, that could be really useful in gaming these things out. Uh, they tend to be sort of higher level, but there is a whole field there. Um, and then of course there's ideas that are poured over from like general techno ethics that are, are still relevant. Um, I'm not sure, uh, you know, exactly what the specific technical details would provide you. It's just going to be, it seems like it's case by case. Um, in terms of, uh, I don't know, my specific thoughts, again, I, I guess I, I just said it, but it's very case by case. I think, um, 
it's it's very hard for me to have general thoughts on you know what should or shouldn't be done it, it always comes down to the specific affordances of the technology um and so you know i can certainly point to many bad things that i don't want to happen like i would not like to introduce you know have the next neurotechnology be the next um you know opioid crisis or whatever like there are absolutely lessons we should learn from the past uh, and and avoid um but again it's, it's very specific to each technology which is probably really not a useful answer but uh i think that's the best i got Let's see, I don't see any on Twitter. So any other questions here at the rear hand? Hi, uh, my name is Andreas. Um, I wrote uh, a paper a couple of years ago um, about the uh, uh, potential of emotional bonding between digital assistants and people, so that you know Alexa becomes your friend, essentially. Um, and, and so basically, the, it, it, it's a different interface between machine and, and people, right? It's the emotional interface. Is that something you came across and have any thoughts on? Um, the specific idea of of emotionally bonding to to AI. Yeah, uh, yeah I think it's like um, um, you. There are many kind of systems that uh, where humans sort of mammalian um, emotional bonding responses are um, mapping and triggering and so on. And you also have like AI systems that kind of like are compatible in that sense. And so, you know, like um, in games, you see this a lot and um, assistive technologies and whatnot. Yeah, well, again, I don't know if I have any uh, really insightful high level thoughts there. Um, maybe a, a sort of related point is that um, I, I guess I do, I do think that there's, uh, it's very useful to have sort of maybe you call them skeuomorphic design principles or something where, um, you know, you really can like anneal society gently uh, into these new technologies, right? By making it very easy to turn off or, you know, unplug. Actually, this is again, as I, I think I mentioned, like a really annoying thing about um, you know, drugs or medications you take is it's really hard to turn off once you swallow them. Like, uh, and so, you know, if you have some kind of extremely uh, high bandwidth interface to an AI assistant or something, um, I think it'll be very important to, to design those things in ways that are like very easy to disconnect, right? Uh, somewhat reversible, not necessarily explantable or anything, but just you know being able to like you know easily power them off or things like that um, will be really critical uh, for this kind of safety side of things. And I think some of I'm not sure this is what you're getting at with the question, but some of these issues of like emotional attachment are they border on the sort of safety side of things where you're sort of thinking about you know what are the what are someone's preferences uh, and you know uh, are we are we somehow subverting those things. But as you can tell by this waffly answer, I think this rapidly takes you into sort of just general ethics and like meta ethics territory where it's like, well, which person's preferences are we optimizing for? Is it like me yesterday or me today? And I, I those people might not think the same thing and they might think very different things after I, um, you know, have some, some neural implant. So, you know, if, if I have my, my dream um, neurotechnology that, that can, um, you know, when I'm, when I'm just exhausted and like can't muster the amount of patience that I wish I could muster, if I can just crank that up, I mean, I think I want that. Uh, I think past me wants that, and I think current me wants that. But of course, again, it's all very case by case. There's, there have to be ways built into these systems to like very carefully watch one's one's own behavior and reactions to these things, and uh, hopefully be able to have these be reversible technologies that you can reset. Yeah, and add that um, the ethics of um, humanity once you have PCIs in any kind of high bandwidth is very very different to to our current ethics. I think this is. The, an example of one technology that will just dramatically alter the species and how we how we operate and how we work and how we exist and how we are, um, and so it is extremely difficult to try and adapt our current uh, norms and our current thinking to um, a world kind of after that. Um, we're, we're starting to hit on boundaries of a few technologies like that that are transcendental in that level. Um, I think another one is gene editing, um, AGI systems, um, and the, yeah, I think the, these systems. And both like the scale of the impact on the change, and the uh, speed at which that change would happen, like we've never encountered anything, anything like this um, uh, before. So it'll be definitely require a lot of um, thinking ahead of trying to reason about those things. I mean, that makes me think of um, the, um, a question around BCI might be um, that maybe doesn't get talked enough about these days, but it used to be uh, is kind of how do you get into um, how hard might it be to get to 
some sort of telepathy type behavior where you have, um, if you connect humans together, um, you then have the same kinds of signals that you might be having through uh, synapses and so on, but now happening, happening maybe in high density between uh, two neocortexes or something. Um, th then you start getting into, uh, now it's really extremely hard and difficult to actually get anything remotely close to um, uh, thinking together or, or, or even something that is consciously, um, where you can consciously be aware of. Um, but you know, how do you think about that and how do you think about those kind of like co-processing um, uh, questions? Oh, is that a question yeah, for me? That's or, a, yeah, that's a question to you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, basically like, hey, um, uh, tele telepathy when? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought that was just a beautiful sort of or how. question. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, well, I don't, know about, I don't know about when or how. I mean, a couple, of, again, random popcorn thoughts coming into my head. One is we do have some interesting case studies on this. There are examples of conjoined twins that share parts of their brain. Uh, and so um, that's, I don't know, one interesting thing to look into uh, with regards to this question. Um, I do think, again, not to make this into a freshman philosophy class, but like there is an interesting question of like, what's the difference between really good persuasion and just me having a direct act line into your neocortex and we're sort of averaging out our ideas. Um, there's clearly a difference on how it's operationalized, but I'm not sure how different it is on the ethical level. Um, the, or, or even just lying to someone, I guess, is another very, uh, very, very peripheral neurotechnology, right? You're sort of influencing their brain in a way that, that is like to your benefit. So. Uh, maybe we can port some ideas over from, from general ethics in this way. But in terms of like telepathy when, um, again, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd advocate exactly running this experiment right now, but like there are no physical principles that are barring you from actually hooking up two people's, you know, neocortis. I mean, you have to do a little bit of engineering here, but like these things are sort of conceivable to do now. I think the question is, you know, what would you be hoping to get out of them? Um, and it becomes a question of, you know, risk and, uh, what what society is interested in learning and, and very reasonable questions. Like if you're going to do neurosurgery on someone, you'd have a, a good scientific reason. Um, I, I did have a picture, I think, earlier of uh, what people sometimes call a hyperscanning or people people have had people communicate with non-invasive um, methods like EEG and things that just aren't, they aren't very high, high bandwidth or high uh, resolution, but people have done prototypes of these. So yeah, I think, I think maybe I'm speaking just only to myself here, but I, I think when I very early on encountered, you know, kind of neurotechnology. And all I saw was like, you know, EEG headbands, like didn't really work that well. And, um, you know, it was sort of disappointing. And, and you'd see people do these experiments, like, wow, we hooked up two people in a lab with the EEG on and they like did interesting things. And you're kind of like, yeah, but like uh, EEG is kind of not sexy and things like that. And and it, it took me a long time to sort of realize that the experimental setups and the ideas people are working on with the existing tech are truly fascinating and they're just bottlenecked by the bandwidth here so it's a very worthwhile exercise if you're interested in this stuff to you know go and you know if you can if you're me maybe speaking just to my own proclivities but like if eeg is kind of boring to you go go look up some interesting weird stuff people have tried with eeg and probably failed at because it didn't work very well or fmri and just imagine what that would be like with uh you know really even just marginally 10 percent you know maybe 10x achievable with current technology higher bandwidth uh and i think there's some pretty exciting uh, stuff that can be done really soon with that technology. Great, uh, one last question. I was wondering what role do you think open source play here? Um, and is, if is it possible at all, do the, the high cost I imagine all this research um, takes? Uh, open source software or open source everything? Open source everything. Yeah, just everything. I will, I mean, uh, I won't make any uh, pronouncements about uh, open source or, or governance in the presence of, uh, of brilliant protolabs minds on this. I think these people have thought about this a lot more than me. I certainly think the world could use, and neurotechnology could use much better um, uh, software in, in lots of use cases. Uh, broadly speaking, to like first order, of course, things are great if they're open source. Um, and of course, I guess there's just with the distinguish, you know, sort of open source, as in you can see the source code versus, you know, what the license fees are and things like that. Uh, which again is way out of my area, but I will say that um, there there is a, a slight it's a slight complication in the world when things come to hardware and like biotech because um, investors in particular in the space like intellectual property matters a lot and uh, in uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, if you remember from earlier on those coils that I showed that brain um, the early field of TMS I was talking or interacting with uh, one of the early pioneers in that space and he says he really regretted open sourcing 
the hardware implementation of his first device because he thought it, it slowed investment in the field. And the companies that built the hardware had to go come up with weird new IP in order to like have a defensible company. So again, that's not to say like no open source by, by any means. I think there's lots of use for open source, but really what I think there's use for is like smart proto labsy people and whoever you are in the audience for thinking of like better ways to, you know, think about patents, intellectual property, things like that. I think that stuff could really uh, move the needle in some of these spaces. And I think like Evan and, and you know, Davidad and people have, have talks on things like this. It's a great uh, place to uh, transition to talk to Adam and about it for us and so on. Milan, thank you so much. This was extremely enlightening. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, great, great to have you. Um, and yeah, thank you.